His love for man, you can't comprehend. He has decided not to do without man because of his love. And he, what did he do in chasing after the man when he was lost? He gave himself. He gave himself. That's how he values man. And when he created the world, he strode Adam. Rule over it. I've given you. And when Adam, like I said, went his way, he came for him. So I've heard this sometimes put in a way that is not good. And you say that ah, God does not need you. Well, I have a problem with the statement. I have a problem with it. Because he's the one, of course, for him to be God, because he has been God, he was not made man, God by man. But when he brought man in the place, you dare not tell God, tell men, they feel like God is unconcerned. The God does not need you. Please, that is not the gospel. God loves men. And when they are far, and when you go to them, say, he loves you. Let them feel like he is desperate for them, because he is, he loves them. It doesn't matter how far we have gone, he comes for us. So I want you, Kaburut, and everyone, please, don't misrepresent God wherever you go, even if they are hanging and they are doing everything and resisting Him. Go for them. Remember Paul stoning the church and fighting the church. What did God do? Go for the man. Is that the man to go for? <laughs> Just the man to go. It doesn't matter. The virus of Eda. Jesus came for us. And you know where you are. You, you know where you are. You know where you are. You know where I was. And there are people who know, they say, I know where, but I wasn't. But remember the exposition of Philippians when we are doing it here. And it is true. Anytime you come to God, if you feel like you are not bad, you are treading on dangerous ground. You better know you are sinner, condemned, and far. There is a man who was rich in the Bible. The scripture says that this man, in all his goodness, he came to Jesus and said, what can I do to inherit the kingdom? Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he was asked, what does the Lord say? What does the commander? He said and said, since I was a youth, I did this. Jesus caught him unexpected. He said, now, he was rich, go sell everything, come and follow me. Ha <laughs> ha, he discovered he was a sinner. He actually ran away. What I'm saying is, he discovered, ha, ah, and he actually went away from Jesus. That's how sometimes our goodness, the Bible says, that our goodness is like, feel the rocks when it is your personal. But we delight in the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. There is no argument. He is God by himself. He loves us. He has decided not to do alone, but to bring us. He is interested. However, he is God alone. And there is no argument. We sing it and worship him. And then we share the word of God. Hallelujah. You got times and seasons in your Let's worship hands. him and sing along.
worship him, worship him, church. Everyone worship him. Oh, glory, glory to the Lamb who was slain. Adore him, church. Bless his holy name. Oh, there is no place for argument. His name is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer, the Lord our fortress, the Lord our strength, the Lord Jehovah Shalom, our peace, Jehovah Shammah. Oh, the Lord our peace, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He is God over himself. You are God by yourself. Glory. Someone worship the Lord. Glory, glory. Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. Jesus. Just declare it to the Lord this morning. He's God all by Himself. Sing you. Thank you for choosing to come and worship here today for sake of our visitors. My name is Charles Luku. Uh, let's to go wandering that pastor. That is it, my identity. Uh, please go with me to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, chapter 5. We're in that season in Kenya. You know where we are? We're waiting. And we thank God for the peace. Thank you for keeping peace and spreading it. We will do the same because we are peacemakers. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers. Shall we call sons of God? We bless the Lord. Uh, thank you for voting and going home and waiting and being there in prayer. It is well, it shall be well. We thank God for bringing us this far. Amen. It shall be well. I want us to read the book of Joshua chapter 5. Allow me to read uh, verse 7. Uh, go down to verse 15. And we read the New King James Version. He says, then Joshua circumcised the sons whom he had raised up, who he raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised, because uncircumcised, because they had not been circumcised on the way. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will load away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Girgah to this day. Now the children of Israel camped in Girgah and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at the twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day that the Passover, they, they ate of the produce of the land on the day after Passover, and even bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased, and on that day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had 
the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. Verse 13, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have no I have I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your hand, take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Amen. That is the reading of God's word. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Uh, the title of my message today, those who are here on Sunday, we had uh, the title of my message was Christ is the answer. And uh, shake the earth is the Lord's and the fullness, even Kenya and the things that are happening and the people. And that is it. Amen. And where Christ is the answer, he turns victims into victors. But let me say, uh, my message is today is Christ is in church. Follow him, obey him. Do what? Follow him and do what? Obey him. Now, the context of what uh, we are leading here is uh, the children of Israel and uh, chapter 5 of Joshua. We did read the whole chapter, but you, if you read the scripture from chapter 3, they have closed the Jordan from the other side and they are in the land of promise, the land of their inheritance. God has victoriously landed them in the land he promised Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob. I want to let you know, and it is true, God's will for his people is to advance them progressively to lay hold of their inheritance. Do you hear me? God's will for his people, and God wants all of us to be his, and his mercies extend outside because he is the creator of all. But in this context, Israel is his people. And his will is that they advance progressively and lay hold of their inheritance. Amen. That is God's will for you. That's God's will for me. And God brought these people to this land. But you remember that they spent how many years? From Egypt to Canaan. 40 years. That is not good progress. You know they went round, loud and around. God's will is that you progress, not go round. And God's will is that you take your inheritance. Because that is his will. But they went round and loud. Why? They didn't follow well. They didn't obey. And for that, they paid a big price of delay. But finally they are here. So Joshua is with the people and they are next to Jericho. Our pastor Moses, as he spoke, he said that when the children of Israel were next to Jericho, they didn't know what God was doing. I think I'm just speaking there. I don't know as we face the things that are around us. Uh, I don't know what you are thinking. And you know, as men that are mortal, the anxiety, there are things you are not sure. But I want to tell you, God, Christ is in charge. Follow him and obey him. And when we follow and obey, there are benefits, all the benefits, and there are many. So these people are there. And God's will is that you advance. And uh, as they are there, now God is preparing them. They had missed it. They, are in, they were 40 years in the desert. God does not want them to waste time in the promised land. He wants them to advance. God's will for you is that uh, we live fruitfully. 
and advance and take what he has for us. I usually say, and it is true, God has things that have your name on. And God wants you to take them. God has doors that you have name on. And God wants you to enter by them. And so God wants to lead you there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So this is the will of God for this. And uh, for them to do that, God prepares them. While they camp next to Jericho, he prepares them to start taking over. Hallelujah. He needed, to, he needed to submit to his direction so that they could experience his power. Amen. Amen. To ensure that, God took them through some events and a few things that I want to us to pick up from this text as he prepared them to continue taking the land progressively and advancing. And I see four steps that I want to bring to your attention here. I will have four of them, but three of them I will not spend a lot of time. But I will spend more time on one of them, the last one. And it is the one that goes with the title of my message. Christ is in charge. Follow him, obey him. Our God is in charge, even this time in the nation. I was reading that scripture. It is in, uh, I think, let me just read it. For you, it is uh, Psalms 22, I love it, and verse 27, it says, All the, uh, the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before God. This is the will of God, that all the ends of the world, and uh, they shall remember and turn to to him that is the will. And all the families of the nations shall worship before God. God's will is that families, unit families and the families of the nations worship the Lord. Amen. And verse 28, the Bible says in my, the New King James Version. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rule over the nations. That one of the nations is Kenya. The kingdom is the Lord's. That is an eternal kingdom. And he rules over the nations. He rules over the nations. Hallelujah. So as we call this, remember, he rules over the nations. And he rules over Kenya. He is in charge. Follow him. Now these four steps, let me go through them. Because God has prepared them to take over. God is preparing them to move into their inheritance. God wants you to advance. God wants you to take your inheritance. It is not scrabble that they call it. There was a time there was a scrabble for Africa. It was not a blessing. They were fighting and taking and tearing it out. It is not that one. There is no scrabble when it comes to the kingdom. It is taking what is our own. Amen. Amen. God has you in mind. God has you in mind. <laughs> Music team. Each one of you. He has not made this platform for scrabble. He has not made ministry for scrabble. Even business is not for scrabble. When we come to the kingdom, it is actually getting to a place. May the Lord take you there. Amen. But for Israel now, and for us, we want to learn this lesson. Now, four steps. Number one, for them to enter, take it. Number one, now, you I call it death of self or death to self. And this, in this passage, is signified by circumcision. So number one, we read from verse seven to nine, and let me read verse nine. The scripture says, after circumcision, and after they were healed, the Lord told Joshua, verse nine, then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I have lowered away the reproach or the shame of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilga to this day. Gilga means the place of lolling, the place of lolling. And the Lord says, I have lowered away the shame of Egypt, of the world. You are set apart. And after going through the desert, they still are shame. And uh, because they were not circumcised. Now, circumcision is a sign of God's covenant with Abraham. And so, 
Israel stands by faith in God's promises. Circumcision symbolizes death of self. One of the major hindrances in our walk with God is self. It is self. One of the things, if you look back in the desert, where they took 40 years, the struggle was self. Self wants to go it on its own way. That's why death to self means I cease from my will and let God. Amen. But in the desert, the struggle, the conflict of Israel with God was that they wanted their way. God wanted them dead. God wanted them dead to self. And it says dead to self. Not to other things, to self. That say, I myself and me. Because when you surrender, then God will have his way. And that, you remember how God was annoyed with them. It was just read here that in the desert they hardened their neck. And the wrath of God came upon them. Why? It was self. God, in this first step, he reminds them that uh, when you die to self, actually self carries reproach and the world. So who will rescue me from this worldliness? Who will rescue me from the world? Who will rescue me from this self? It is only death to self. And God reminds these people that are his own. That this is it. You must die to self. I want you to progressively take the land. I want you to progressively go to your inheritance. Amen. I don't want you to miss it. Remember the covenant. Now, circumcision is symbolizes death to self. It is an act of faith and a spiritual preparation. Hallelujah. And so daily, one thing I want to say concerning self, and it is real, self does not die in a day. We die daily. And I say that again, that this self does not die. What happens is suppressed by the power of the cross and the power of the word, but when he is let go, he comes back. And comes in a big way. And I tell you, this is a continuous battle. But God is reminding them, for you to progressively advance with me and take what is yours, you need to remember, death to self, number one. And that is why I say, I have lowered the shame of Egypt. The shame of Egypt the shame of the world goes with itself. That's why we fight. That's why the things you see in Kenya is about this card, this one. It's God's self. When you fight, when we tear one another, when we do all these things, when we speak carelessly, when we look at our neighbor and somehow we go to our corner and start talking about another tribe in a manner that makes you superior. It is self that is speaking. This person, this one, and he has to be suppressed. He shows up. We are all tempted every time with this. And so that's why we need to remember it is the power of the cross, the nails. That's why uh, this man called Paul said in uh, Galatians chapter 2 and 20, he said, I am crucified with Christ. I, yet I live. So it means die to self, but live. I am crucified with Christ. Yet I live. But the life that I now live, I live by faith, by the faith of the Son. Hallelujah. We are called to live and daily. And Paul says, I box myself daily. So I want to tell you, God was reminding them this first step, death to self. And daily do it. Hallelujah. So it's, it's a reminder and it's something to pursue daily. Number two, and I'll tie them together. The second one is that, what I call the testimony to the blood of the Lamb. What did they do? In verse 10, the scripture says, they observed what? The Passover. Verse 10. 
They observed the Passover on the 14th day of the month. Now, the Passover is symbolic. By taking the Passover, Easter is reminded of their redemption by the blood of the Lamb. Redemption. The Passover symbolizes redemption. The purchasing of their lives from the world and the, the redemption. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, the scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is no remission. It means they are reminded that forgiveness came by the blood. It is not your own. This is redemption. You have been purchased. There is the slaughter. There is the of the lamb and the shedding of blood for your redemption. They are reminded. They observed the Passover. And again, the Passover was to a reminder of what happened. It is not what was happening that day. It was a reminder. Hallelujah. These are things to remind them. And to call them to mind as they advance so that they can follow and obey. Because God is in charge. Hallelujah. So secondary, redemption. And how do we turn redemption now? The blood patches them. But when you look at circumcision, what do you note? Joshua was told, do what? Circumcise them. In fact, for, for the interesting one is that one of Abraham, the man circumcised himself. I don't understand how the story goes, but he circumcised the whole house. I, I have not gone to the details and we know it happened, but even Abraham circumcised his whole house. I don't know how this happened. Even him, he was. But the point here is circumcision is a voluntary thing you do, and it's painful. The redemption of the blood is to be bought. Circumcision is painful. It's something you voluntarily give yourself and allow. This is how it ties. The blood is shed for redemption. Come in. Die to self, you must agree the pain. And that's where to Nakwama. The redemption is by the blood. But once we come in the death to my Kwamabo, that is the main problem with God. And may the Lord help us. He reminds them. Death to self and testimony of the blood. They are being reminded. That is number two. Testimony to the blood of the Lamb. Observance of the Passover. We do this every first Sunday. We remind ourselves. Praise the Lord. But I want to under reminder, please continue reminding yourself daily. This is daily self to death to self. Allow me to go to the third one. The third thing in uh, verse 11 and 12, it can be splashed, right? Displayed on the screen, media. What does it say? Let's read together. Verse 12, let's read it together loudly. Now, number three, reminder, step number three, I see, observed here, is what I call leadiness to labor. And you say leadiness to labor. Leadiness to labor. Yeah, because it says that. They ate the produce of the land. And what happened? The manna ceased. Now, observing the Passover stood for God's deliverance out of Egypt and from judgment as he destroyed the firstborn. Now, circumcision comes as a sign of death to self. Now, in Egypt... The children of Israel labored as slaves for their masters. And they ate of the same. Are we together? 
There was no manna in the land of Egypt. They were laboring and they were feeding on the same. However, they were under the taskmasters. But they were eating out of the labor of their hands. But under bondage. Now, in the desert, during their journey, God fed them with what? With manna. They were not laboring. They were on the move. They were in the desert. They are in the wilderness. God gave them what? Manna. But now they enter the Lord. The scripture says, on that day, they ate of the produce of the Lord. That was the labor of their enemies. They entered. The enemies were being pushed out because their cup had been filled and they had sinned against God and God was removing them from the land. But they had labored in this land. So the children of Israel came and ate of the produce of the land. And what happened to manna? The manna ceased. The manna stopped. I want to read something about a read in a commentary. The point here is God's will for you is not that you live on manna. As we get into a place, God wants to bless the work of our hands. God wants you to supply your needs by labor. And he will bless the labor. In the desert, there can be provision here and there. Sometimes because God is miraculous. And I know he's a God of miracles. And that is what makes him God. He does something that is not connected with you. He will do it. When he raises the sun, you don't have to do anything. You just bring it up. When it is set, you don't have to do anything. It just goes down. It is him. And God can come your way and do something without your effort. However, God has called us to work. And in the garden, God put man there to labor. Now listen to this commentary. I love it. We just listen to it. I picked it somewhere and I will read it as it, I picked it. It says, there is a way in which we cannot separate between land and labor. Our ability to produce does not arise solely from our ability or diligence, but also from the resources available to us. We agree that you can labor, but you're also connected with the resources. God has given the land, and the, 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 the land, they have to uh, sorry labor. Let me continue. Conversely, the land does not work itself. You hear that? The land does not do what? Ah, you are put in the land, and they were told, it froze with what? Milk and? But does it work itself? What are they to do? This is the reminder. As they got into the land, the manna ceases. It's time to labor. Let me continue. It says this. By the sweat of our faces, we must produce bread. Genesis 3.19. You remember? This point is made quite priceless in Joshua 5, 11 and 12. The one I read. That the manna ceased. Because we must sweat to produce bread. And uh, I don't want to read it. I say on that day, the Passover, on that day after the Passover, that on that very day, the pro they ate the produce of the land, all that, and the manna ceased. And the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land that year, continuously. I want to say this, read it on. Israel has survived on the divine gift of manna throughout their wilderness wandering. But God had no intention of making this a permanent solution to the problem of provision. I like that. The land was to be worked. Sufficient resources and fruitful labor were integral elements of the promised land. I said sufficient resources and fruitful labor 
Sufficient? Because we need resources. And we need to engage in fruitful labor. He continues to say, the point may seem obvious, but it is worth making nonetheless. While God, listen to this, while God may miraculously at times for our, uh, provide for our physical needs, the norm, the norm is for us to sustain ourselves on the fruit of our labors. Hallelujah. And I'm saying this as I continue. Whenever God has put you to labor, maybe you are connecting this with the digging and the farmer because we are talking about the land. But I want to say wherever you are laboring, wherever God has put you to labor, labor and labor diligently. If you sit in an office, that's where you labor diligently. If you sit in a business, that's where you labor diligently. If you serve people in that desk, serve them diligently. And the Lord wants you to labor and bless your labor. And the Lord wants you to give yourself. That's why he has provided. He provides the land. He provides the opportunity. Labor. Hallelujah. And I say one of the things that hit our land is neglect of labor and service. There is no labor and service. It is labor where you are. Are you employed? You are squandering the employer's time. You are sinning. We are sinning. That is not labor. God made the manna to cease that he may bless the work of your hands. And some of us, times we are caught in complaining. They are not doing this. They are not doing this. I see this as a reminder. Laziness to labor. Turn to your neighbor. Tell them labor. Labor diligently is a command of God. Uh, uh, I don't see like we take this one. By the way, and I, let me labor here. Tell your neighbor, labor, labor. diligently. It is God's command. He was speaking to Israel. He reminded them, it's labor. Get to the land and labor. And Paul said in the, I think it's the book of Thessalonians, those who don't work, they should not eat. Let me glorify that. I know people are looking for opportunities and we pray that God opens doors. But don't be lazy around because God has called us to labor. Look for something you can do. Trust God. Say, Lord, your word says we labor. And you bless the labor of our hands. And as we enter the place, it is that God will bless the land. God will bless what we do. Lord, make a way. And I pray that God make a way for us. And some of the things that are happening here is that God tells them, it's time to labor. So trust God for wisdom to show you where you can labor. And when I say labor, I mean even going around. You find a stone on the road and you leave it there. Someone will come and stab on it. Stop your car if it is necessary. If you see they can cause an accident, labor. Do something. Hallelujah. Yes, go down. If you see things are not in order, labor. Put them in order. All oh, their files that are not be found, it is in an office. God forbid they shall be said of your office. God forbid that people will come to that office, go complaining because we did labor. You know what will happen? God is not pleased by this. But he says, get lady to labor. Let me go to the last one. Subjection, number four. Subjection to Christ as the Lord. This is the last one. This way I want to labor more and then we'll be done. Christ is in charge. Follow him. Obey him. Hallelujah. Now, Joshua, this last one, is not something that is spoken to the whole camp. And if we read it now from verse 13, the scripture says uh, that uh, from the NIV, it says that now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up, he saw a man standing in front with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up and asked him, are you for us or for our enemies? Now Joshua gets out of the camp. This is the, my last point. 
subjection to the Lord or to Christ as Lord. Joshua is outside the camp alone as the leader. And they are facing Jericho because this, they are already in the land, but they are to conquer Jericho. And Jericho is fortified with a wall that probably was the, the toughest in the land. And it is at this point, and I believe this was for us, God gives this general or the leader this experience for us today. And I'm sure he must have communicated this to the camp. Now we encounter Joshua outside the camp at Gilgal, next to the city, to the wall. What do you think Joshua was doing outside the wall? I suppose he was concerned as the leader, very concerned. Here is Jericho, he is the leader. And he's supposed to lead the, the children of Israel step by step. You know, you remember Moses is gone. He is the one leading. You know, there are those things that confront you. You are the one. Like Joshua, it is personal, it is you. Not the desire that you are leading a community, but it's something that confronts you. It is there, it's enormous. That is what happened to Joshua. He is there, and I'm sure he is concerned. How do we get through and attack Jericho? Probably this. Then, you know, they had little experience for this kind of task. Very little experience coming from the desert. What, a, what, a kind, of, what kind of people, although they had men of the army. Now, beside this, you know their equipment. What they have? They had spears, they had swords, they had slings, and whatever you, you can imagine they had come up with. That is no match for the job, for what was ahead of them. But God wanted them to progressively advance to their inheritance. Remember, Christ is in charge. Follow him and obey him. And this is the lesson here. Now, can you feel Joshua? Can you feel Joshua there at the wall alone, looking at the task, wondering? And uh, God is good. It is at uh, this time, the other time God is leading them from the camp, but he gets off and God comes. He gets an encounter. He must have felt a weight on his shoulder and wondering the world is crumbling on him. He is the leader. He must have been meditating. But God gave this servant an encounter that made him, I say, made him grasp, get hold of an important truth that was vital in preparing to advance by his power. And I believe for all of us saints of God, we need to get hold of this truth today so that we can advance to our inheritance individually and corporately, even as a nation. And as a church, amen. And so Joshua, as you say, looked up. And I am sure the Lord looked at his mind and his thoughts. And I say this, Joshua must have missed something in his mindset or perspective. And this is it. We will see it. This happens to us when we face enormous things. Are you in this kind of place? Listen to the story and identify with this as we learn the lesson. The scripture says, suddenly, as Joshua was deeply engaged in the task and wondering, he had an, ex an unexpected experience. And verse 13 says, he looked up and saw a man in front of him with a drawn sword in his heart. And no wonder he is thinking about attack. He is thinking about battle. And then he sees a man opposite him. The, the, the NIV says opposite. In another tongue, There's another tongue, There are people, have you heard mungedos? That word mungedos. The connotation is that people go to look. <laughs> But Joshua was not wasting time. That word is usually used for 
busy bodies wasting time. Joshua is going out. Joshua is busy, engaged in mind. I'm sure wondering, looking at the wall, how do we advance suddenly? He looked and saw a man standing in front of him. The man is facing Joshua and has a sword. I believe Joshua was also armed. He is a soldier. He is leading people to attack and take the land. He must have been dressed. And Joshua is uh, bold. Huh? The scripture says, he looks at the man. And Joshua did not flee. This is the kind. We will not, we will not flee. Whatever happens. Because the Lord will want to speak to us. Whether it's an enemy, face him. If it is the Lord, speak to him. Hallelujah. I think that uh, uh, this man Joshua knew, I am with the Lord. Though there is a lesson here, he is learning. When you meet the enemy, you don't run. Spiritual. He knew we will face the enemy and fight. And if it is the Lord, you speak to him. Or he speak to you. So Joshua is there. Bold and there. Then the question, he looked at the man, the concern was in his heart. But when he looked at the man with the sword and the position, I am sure Joshua, this suggests that he, either this man is, has come to fight for Israel or to counter. You know, he is opposite. So he asked, he looked like he suggested he could be looking at me wanting to support. He could be looking at me wanting to fight. You know, I am the leader. And Joshua asked a question. Verse 13 B, he asked a question. Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our enemies? This is the underlying thing. Now, Joshua has a mindset. Remember, Christ is in charge. Follow him and obey him. He is in charge. But Joshua is asking, are you for us or are you against us? Now, let me ask, when somebody is for you or against, are they in charge really? It sounds they are supporting, isn't it? The question is, are you supporting us or are you Fighting us. <laughs> Are you supporting us or fighting us? And God want to teach us something. This man has been with the Lord. You know, this man has worked with Moses. You know Joshua? He has been on the mountain with Moses. He has had lessons. He has seen the miracles. But I want to tell you, whether we walk with the Lord for 40 years or 50 years, we are still a work in progress. His ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. They are infinite. Who can comprehend the knowledge of God? And the day you feel like you know, that is the day you start going down. Oh, may the Lord help me. Even as I preach to you, I am still waiting to be taught. Joshua is leading. Joshua has been spared. For the 40 years, he is the survivor. You know what? He can be proud. But you know he is here wondering. But you know it is this that the Lord is still teaching us. Joshua has this experience. So he asked, are you for us? Or are you against us? And I want to agree that Joshua did not suspect it is one of the soldiers who were there. He knew them. <laughs> I think he knew most of them. He must have been familiar. And so he, this is not one of the soldiers. This must be a stranger. And he goes on. Then what happens? The man answered Joshua's question. And this is what it reveals. Joshua is given an answer. The first thing is the man's position, Joshua confronts. Now the next thing is that when he asks a question, are you for us or against us? The man asks us a question, the question, and it reveals the man's identity. Who is the man? 
And this answer is what I say reveals a kind of mindset and perspective that poses a hindrance as we walk with God. A perspective, a mindset that was in Joshua. What then is this mindset? Can I say? We tend to see the battles we face as our, our battles. It is my battle, you know. I have had many times, you know. I am going through many battles. Sometimes they are so personal. It is you and it is you fighting. We tend to make them our battles. And the forces we face that are formed against us, we make them like they are against us and our individual causes. They are facing, they are against your issue, they are against your cause, it is your battle. And the truth is, Joshua is facing a battle. Can I say, this is true somehow, because it is your battle, isn't it? It is your issue, it is personal. But you know, God is helping Joshua, helping us today to know that he comes and he wants to break that mindset because he wants us to progress. What is the danger when you make it your battle? And the Bible says, don't be anxious about anything. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. But in everything by prayer, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. Now, when these things come, anxiety come, I'm sure Joshua also had his anxiety. But the truth is, although this is true somehow, it is your battle. In another way, it is not true. This is an issue, and this is where God is communicating to Joshua, today and to me. It is your battle. But there's another level, it's another mindset that God is breaking. Listen to me. What did the commander give as the answer? The answer given by the commander, given to Joshua. He asked a question, are you for us or for our enemies? Then verse 14 says, neither. Neither. None, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. As commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Hallelujah. Are you for us? Again, as us. The negative question, neither. That is negative, isn't it? Negating that, saying, no, I am not. And God is saying, I am. No, this man is saying, I am not. Then it is clear at that point, now Joshua, you see how he, 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 he behaves. The Bible says, then he fell down to the ground. One of the things that Joshua recognized, this is not another man fighting the battle. Joshua fell to worship. Joshua recognized this is God. And I want to say, uh, without going to details, this is the appearance of the prayer incarnate. Christ, you know, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, everlasting. And uh, if you read chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, you will see that Jesus, the Lord, Christ, was with them in the desert. He is the Lord that gave them water. It was the Lord that gave water. It was Christ, yet not revealed in the flesh, because he comes in the flesh in our time. But that time he comes, but he is with them. And now he comes to Joshua. Joshua bows down and worship. The reason why you realize there is God, he there is was an angel. The angel of God would tell Joshua, rise up. I am not God. You cannot worship an angel. Read chapter 19 of Revelation verse 10. Jo uh, John wanted to worship the, the angel that came to bring the message. But he said, no, you cannot worship. I am a servant like you. But this time, as Joshua bows down and worship, the worship is received. Joshua recognizes this is God. Do you hear me? Christ is in charge. Follow him and obey him. 
Now the mindset here is, Joshua is asking, are you for us or against us? Now the commander says, I am neither. But then he gives the reason why he gives that kind of answer. He says, I have come as commander of the Lord. I have now come of the army of the Lord. Two things I want you to understand here as we bring it down to a close. Do you get the mindset of Joshua? He said, The first principle, and I now go back to the title of my message. Two things observed here, and God is speaking to Joshua and to you today and myself. Christ is in charge, not in support. You didn't hear me. Listen to me. God is not your support. He is in charge. We are doing our things. God, come and support. Uh, and that's why I say, no other foundation a man can lay except Christ. That's why I speak to you. You have gone to church. You become religious. And somewhere on the way, people ask you, are you saved? You say, you try to look around. I say, I think from my assessment, it looks like I was charged. Yeah, I am saved. Let me tell you, it all begins on the foundation God is not coming to support our things. He is coming as the Lord. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, He is Lord, you will be saved. Our salvation is in God. He is in church. He is not in support. Joshua is asking, are you supporting us? Are you against us? He says, neither. I come as the one in charge. The first thing he is want to demolish. And may the Lord help us. God is not coming in his support. May the Lord help us to begin with him and walk with him daily. The scripture says clearly, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. We tend to try and do things and bring God to support. This approach is not right. May the Lord help us. Rather, we are called to submit and to follow Christ. Can you say submit, submit. and follow? Again, submit, submit. And, follow. and follow. So Joshua, know these questions. It is your call to submission and follow. You are called to obedience and follow. The reason why they missed and stayed for 40 years, they missed to submit and they followed their own ways. You know, thank God, it was not a rebuke. The way the Lord speaks to Joshua, he's not even rebuking. Our Father, he speaks in another way. He says, I have come. He says, Joshua, don't you know what is this thought that you have? You don't trust me. Now he comes, he says, I have come as. And when the Lord appears and comes, he convicts us, he reveals to us his ways. Joshua is understanding, and so he's getting it clear. He is in charge, not in support. As believers, we are co workers with God, and true. The children of Israel are working with God. Amen. And Joshua is a soldier in the army. Of the people of God, he is co-working with God. And we must follow the Lord, submit to his authority, take orders, and commit all in his hands. Realize the battle is his, and he is the chief commander. He is the chief commander. There seems to be no question about Joshua. He understood it. How? Because he turns and says, what has my Lord to say to his servant? Now Joshua has no question about that. You see, now he was asking a question. Are you for us? Are you? But now he's saying, my Lord, <laughs> what have you to say? That is what the Lord looks for us. 
You are there enormous. You are facing these things and say, Lord, which way? Lord, which way in this one? Help me, Lord. Is there somebody in the house who's saying, Lord, help me? This is where God found Joshua. He is wondering, do I have somebody to help me? But the Lord says, I'm in charge. Do you know when God told the children of Israel, I am taking you to the land, he didn't say, I am sending you there. I come and support. He was saying, I'm sending you but I go before you. Let me tell you, when I came to Kiaburut, one of the things that spoke to me is this. One of those days that I was pushing and I was thinking about this church and somehow things seemed not to work, the Lord helped me and led me here and spoke to me. I was glad. Some of the people asked, Pastor, how are you encouraged like this? It is times like those the Lord gave me his word and encouraged me. You know what the Lord told me? He said, when I do, I love the church. I am the one who said, go ye and reach the world. I am interested about church more than you. I'm interested in you more than I am, more than you are interested. You are thinking about setting a church somewhere. But you know what? I have gone ahead of you. I am beckoning you to come and work with me. You didn't hear me. In the things that God has for you, he has gone before you. Then he is beckoning. Come and join me. This is your Lord. This is my plan for you. Come on, come to me. Oh, I hope you are getting it, receiving it. No, I know because we are men, we are under the sun. We have this enormous thing confronting us. But God, you know, I saw Joshua and I saw myself, that little thing in Kiaburo. I'm still not big. I'm still that little thing. I'm still that little thing. It is Jehovah. He is in charge. But you know, when he picks the stone, that little thing, he makes it. When you are in him, it is not about me, it's not by mine. And I, I would picture Joshua the wall, picture myself standing here. He said, Lord, I am here. You are there dealing with the issues, dealing with the walls, dealing with the issues. Come on for our nation. Let's trust God. He is there dealing with it. Hallelujah. He called us here. He has gone ahead of us tomorrow. He is beckoning us to our inheritance. He will come in this nation. In the name of Jesus, do I have a witness who is saying he has gone ahead of us? He is beckoning us to the inheritance of this nation. He has gone before us. He has gone before us. Thank you, Lord, for going before us and teaching us this. I say, the Lord longs to give direction as we submit to him. Praise the Lord. Time is gone. But my second principle, there are just two. First one, Christ is in church, not in support. What does that mean? Personal presence. Present. He's present in church. Hallelujah. Personal presence. Number two. Hannah, Joshua, and we learned today. Assurance of his provision. I'll call that personal provision. He said what? Are you for us or not for us? Or against us? Neither. I come as commander. As the one who has who had come to take charge, the Lord. Or the one who is in charge. The Lord is reminding Joshua and us that he gives himself and he, his personal presence. Remember Moses? He said, if your presence is not good with us, let us remain here. Moses understood the personal presence. And then he says, and his powerful provision. God is demanding Joshua, personal presence, in charge, not in support. I am present. Then secondary, my personal provision, assured. What does that mean? He says, as the Lord, the commander of the Lord's army, he is saying, Joshua, do you think this lad can be taken with a small army that is in Kirka? Look at that small army of men gathered there. And Joshua is already fearing 
And uh, if the head, the head is uh, the right, the, this mindset. What about the people in the camp? They are wondering this way. But you know, we better believe God. But I'm sure they are butterflies. But Jehovah comes to Joshua. What an assurance. I am the commander of the armies. It is not the army in Gilgal. I come with the host of heaven. Hallelujah. There are more who are on our side than those who are against us. This is what God is telling Joshua. I come with the host of heaven. Fear not. Don't be terrified of them. I'll go ahead of you. I have a host to surround you. And if you read 2 Kings, remember there is this servant of Elisha. They were surrounded. Second King chapter 8, they were surrounded uh, by the, the ben Hadda, the king of Assyria. And when they were surrounded, the, the, the servant came out and saw the army surrounding and he cried. And as he cried, Elisha called God and said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the Bible says he opened his eyes and he looked. He saw what? Chariots of fire. They were not visible. <laughs> They were invisible. Elisha knew they were there. And uh, for the fear of the servant, God was faithful to open his eyes. The Bible says we believe and we see. God has not called us to see first, but to believe, he told Thomas. Thomas, come and touch my the horse. Thomas did not go to touch the holes of the nails on Jesus' hand, but he said, my Lord and my God. But Jesus had said, blessed is he who believe before he sees. But this is the truth. We believe there is, there is a host for you. There is a family you fight for. You are not alone. There is a host. There is a community we fight for. Even here, there is a host. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. And I want us to pray this afternoon. I want to ask the music team just to come. I want to ask them to come. And as they come, I want you to see Joshua responds in verse 14b. He says, he fell on his face, bowed down and said, what has the Lord to say to his servant? God wants to give us direction. And beyond there, I want you to take notes. Christ is the hand. He is in charge. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This scripture reminds us that God is not present to act as a rescue team that comes in when trouble hits. Rather, we are reminded that the battle is his and our law is that, that of a soldier and a servant. We are here to serve him, to do his will, to follow him, and depend on him completely. He does not come to support, but he comes to be in charge. When you have somebody who supports, they withdraw, they may be wary. God comes to be in charge. Come on, charge. Arise and all oh, he is in charge. Follow him and obey him because he wants us to take our inheritance. The captain, the last thing he said, or this commander, he said, remove your sandals. This place is holy ground. This speaks of surrender. They speak of surrender. Submitting to his authority. Submitting to his presence and power. Bible says, humble yourself, therefore, under his mighty hand of God. He may ex that he may exhort you. That is First Peter chapter 5, 6 and 7. Casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares. And the church rises up. Oh, be lifted. We want to lay our crowns. We want to surrender. We
hasn't come to support, come on, open up your mouth and say, Lord, oh, Lord, I lay my crowns down. I lay my crowns, my mansion. I know you have come to be in charge. I know you have come to lay the Lord. You have gone ahead of me. Come on, George, are you there? Are you facing an enormous matter as a nation?